All right. All right. It's the CES meeting. It's January 11th, and we're going to talk again to this week about async contexts. Um, and this time we have Justin Ridgewell, the champion of the proposal. And uh, Mark has been doing an investigation and will walk us through it again. So some of this will be a, a brief recap of last week's me meeting. Um, and uh, yeah, please take it. Welcome, Justin. Take it away, Mark. OK, so let me uh, actually let me, I'm going to say a few words before I start projecting. Um, the um, So uh, Justin, uh, together with uh, Legenda Cass and others, uh, have been uh, have a proposal before TC39 called Async Context. Uh, and they've it's doing something, it's proposing to add to JavaScript uh, something that um, would be available for general programming um, and cannot be done at the user level purely within obje an object capability system. You know, hardened, if, if one started with simply hardened JavaScript uh, and attempted to do uh, async context as a library, async context as it's proposed uh, could not be done, but a subset of it, uh, uh, the synchronous subset of it, can be done with perfect fidelity. And the full proposal can be understood as a kind of temporal, a weirdly temporal extension of the one that can be done. So that was all quite mysterious. Um, the hypothesis that I want us to examine here um, is that Although this cannot be done within, although it cannot be done at the user level within a synchronous, a normal synchronous imperative OCAP language, uh, um, that, and, it, and the reason it can't be done is it violates the foundational safety rules. The hypothesis is that it doesn't violate the, the safety purpose of those safety rules. Uh, to put it another way, um, uh, the safety rules underlying OCAPs, uh, we've spent decades, literally many decades, um, uh, depending on which community, since the mid 60s when OCAPs were invented, uh, exploring and appreciating the safety benefits that come from the foundational rules. Um, so the, uh, the question that we're raising is actually quite a square, scary question, which is, is there a relaxation, the particular relaxation being proposed, of the foundational rules that doesn't actually break the safety purposes that we have found over the decades are served by the safety rules? And there's no simple way to explore this because it's kind of, you have to reason kind of backwards um, uh, because it's impossible to just, you know, there, there's no procedure for reconstructing all of the safety purposes that, that, that were derived from those safety rules and see which get broken. All we can do is kind of probe for which particular things seem to have gotten broken. Um, so, with all of that said, I am going to now project. Sorry about the delay here. Trying to. Okay, well, I'm going to project. Now I'm going to do this. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. So this is the proposal itself. And yeah, Legenda Cass and Justin Ridgewell um, uh, 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 are the uh, champions. Uh, I think that the best summary of the proposal is the um, uh, emulation of it within JavaScript, not within hardened JavaScript, but within uh, full JavaScript from which we can uh, derive a closest approximation hardened JavaScript. So, so, so Justin's slide 11 uh, uh, shows the most of the most of the API right here, um, and then uh, and this part of the API uh, is equivalent to something one could code in hardened JavaScript without breaking the rules. Um, uh, there, uh, so this part of the API by itself is equivalent to the uh, Justin's earlier slide on slide six, which, as you can see has only changed the name uh, async context to sync context. Uh, this one is equivalent to something that's safe. Uh, but the thing about async context on slide 11 is that uh, it is understood to be combined with this wrap function. And there's two levels of ambition with regard to wrap. Oh, and, and Justin, uh, please interrupt me if I'm getting anything wrong or if there's some crucial detail that needs to be interjected. Um, the, so it's understood, in, so it should be understood in terms of this additional wrap function. And with the functionality of the wrap function uh, added, uh, you now have a semantics that cannot be coded in a, um, in a declarative OCAP language, including cannot be coded into um, uh, hardened JavaScript. Um, and there's two levels of ambition for the wrap function. What wrap does is it captures a, um, an a, a, the, the, the async context bindings collectively, um, which are normally associated with being in a particular temporal context, being executing in a particular point in time, it does sort of the equivalent of closure capture of it. It creates a closure that captures the uh, collective async bindings. All, all these terms I will come, be coming back and explaining, but it's easier to just state it and then explain it. Uh, captures all of those temporal bindings collectively such that when the resulting closure returned by wrap is executed, uh, all those collective um, uh, bindings associated with that temporal context are restored. And the two levels of ambition with wrap is wrap could be exposed directly, um, uh, which is uh, what they propose on, on slide 14, or that's the, the higher level of ambition, the lower level of ambition is that wrap is to be understood only as being encapsulated within um, uh, the enhanced behavior of then uh, and uh, other semantics having to do with JavaScript asynchrony that is um, uh, essentially analogous to then or can be understood as derived from then. So there's and in the spec, there's an internal then function. And then the behavior of the original uh, promise.prototype.then, as well as the behavior of the await syntax are understood as being in defined in terms of the behavior of the internal then function. So in this um, uh, uh, smaller ambition, uh, wrap being encapsulated, it would only be projected temporally forward but, uh, in terms of those things that were defined in terms of the internal then function. Um, okay, so now let me explain what all of that means. And to do that, I will turn to um, uh, the readme on the PR that I've created for exploring this. So this the PR is um, 
uh, the endo PR 1424. Um, uh, the uh, PR that I, uh, the version of that that I presented last week, I've created a snapshot to correspond exactly to the CES meeting recording, uh, which is PR 1428. But um, as the living PR, I modified 1424, which is the one I'll be showing today. Um, this is the README for 1424, and it shows um, uh, a, it, it breaks down the exploration of the semantics of sync context into these four steps, sorry, five steps, zero, one, two, three, and four. These are all variations on the sync context. And the reason is that number four uh, shows the um, minimal, for, the, the, the form of sync context that has the minimal breakage of object capability rules that enables the uh, explanation of the full async context proposal. And then, so set, step zero here is essentially um, Justin's slide six showing the sync context, um, the, um, but written in proper hardened JavaScript with no extraneous mutability. Um, slide five here is essentially uh, Justin's slide 11 and slide 13 that shows the async context with the wrap function. Uh, and then um, uh, slide six is to the analogy, slide six is to slide five as slide four is to slide zero. In other words, the transition that I make from slide zero through these other steps to get to slide four I then apply that transformation to slide five to get to slide six. And the result is that we can have the narrowest conversation about the way in which the full proposal breaks the object capability rules by manipulating hidden mutable state. Um, Okay, so I think at that point, the uh, going through the sequence here is the best way to proceed. Um, uh, and some of this will be a bit redundant with uh, what we covered last week. So I'll go through the redundant part quickly, but it is fresh code because I rephrased the code to be um, easier to understand. Okay. So uh, this is essentially uh, Justin's uh, slide six, uh, but written in proper uh, hardened JavaScript with no extraneous mutability. So the no extraneous mutability is by hardening the sync context class, which also, which freezes the class and then freezes everything that's, that's reachable by um, property and prototype traversal, traversal, starting with the class, which means it freezes the class, it freezes the prototype, and it freezes all of the inherited methods. Uh, and in hardened JavaScript, uh, all the primordials are also um, already implicitly frozen. Uh, and this is all necessary um, uh, to understand this code as being a shim of what, of what is being proposed as a new primordial. So in the proposal, sync context, uh, well, really async context is being proposed as a new primordial. Uh, in hardened JavaScript, this would be considered, you know, we're, we're, we're considering, we would, you know, if, if it were to go forward, we would um, add it to hardened JavaScript as a, um, whitelisted and therefore considered to be safe and powerless primordial. Um, and as a primordial in hardened JavaScript, 
uh, it would be, in fact, hardened. It would have no extraneous mutable state. Notice, though, that it captures this let storage variable, which is where the source of all of the interesting angst about examining this proposal. But uh, so that's where the, the, the uh, fundamental mutability is that we're going to be worried about. Uh, but also, uh, just as, um, I'm also hardened, added this constructor here to harden the instance so that we're getting rid of the extraneous mutability of the instance. There's no own properties of the instance. So this isn't changing just in semantics at all. Um, it's just doing it the way it, it, it would be um, uh, done so that there's um, no additional mutability to, that confuses the issue. Okay, now. Um, what is this? Um, to understand what this is doing, I'm going to take us uh, first to um, the um, uh, um, yeah the yes. Um, so I uh, what I'm what I'm doing. Uh, this week that's different than last week is uh, I did an experiment, um, which is what you're seeing here, which is uh, to contain the complexity of the exploration um, is I tried rephrasing it from using class uh, notation to using objects as closure notation. And I found that that really simplified the conversation tremendously, but it means that it has less fidelity as a shim. The proposal was proposing it as a class, the shim is shimming it as a class. So rephrasing the proposal in terms of objects as closures has some um, differences from what's being proposed, but no essential differences. It just makes the, it, may, it just, makes the discussion of the deviation from object capabilities more constrained. So the differences are that rather than a class, we have a making function. Uh, there is no prototype. The methods are not inherited from the prototype. Rather, the methods are uh, own properties of the async context instance, but it's still the case that it breaks the rules because there's still a mutable variable, this outer let variable, they close over, which would not be allowed if the maker were to be admitted as a power, powerless primordial. Um, uh, and But then to understand what this is doing, let's now go to my next slide, which is slide two, which is, um, a shallow binding implementation of the same semantics. Okay, now, now I will explain about, with this in front of us, I will now explain about dynamic scoping, fluid scoping, shallow binding, and then with my next slide, deep binding. Uh, so these are all concepts from the historical um, uh, literature on uh, lambda languages, in particular, um, uh, Lisp. Well, actually, I'll, instead of saying lambda language, say Lisp language. The, the 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 history of Lisp languages. So Lisp was understood as uh, from the beginning as being very close to the lambda calculus, but the original Lisp, um, John McCarthy's Lisp in the 1950s. Um, uh, deviated from lambda calculus by using dynamic scoping rather than fluid than lexical scoping. In dynamic scoping, a variable use is um, uh, looked up, you know, to find the corresponding definition. You know, what's the value of the variable? You have to figure out what's the binding occurrence that determines the value of the variable. And in the original list with dynamic scoping, you found the binding occurrence by literally looking backward stack frame by stack frame until you found a stack frame that defined the binding uh, for that variable name. 
Um, and uh, that's obvious, you know, to modern, modern eyeballs, that's obviously um, uh, non-modular and unstructured, and in fact creates all of the problems that you would expect it creates. Uh, but they went surprisingly far with that. Uh, and then in, um, in the uh, early 70s, there was a rediscovery through uh, actors of the power of uh, lexical scoping and lambda calculus that the Lisp languages were missing. And that led to the uh, creation of the scheme language, which was the, the um, which was, was the next version of Lisp. And then that, uh, and scheme was a purely lexically scoped language. It's very, very close to an object capability language as shown by the object capability schemes that were then later derived from it. Um, uh, and uh, essentially all modern languages are descendant from, um, uh, are, are lexically scoped languages. And if they're in the Lisp tradition, they're very much descendant from uh, that rediscovery in scheme. So the, to understand the difference between lexical scoping and dynamic scoping, you can think of both of them as defining intervals over which a variable is bound to a value where those intervals can be nested. So in lexical scoping, the intervals are, let's say, defined by open curly brackets in JavaScript. So the open curly bracket, uh, closed curly bracket, defining a scope uh, where the scope contains a variable definition. Um, uh, that variable definition is the um, uh, 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 is the one that determines the meaning of a use occurrence of the same variable name uh, within that interval of text between the open curly bracket and the clo closed curly back bracket, except for scopes in which that variable definition is shadowed, which are nested open curly brackets, closed curly bracket uh, intervals. Uh, they contain an, a different definition of the same variable. The dynamic scoping can be understood as um, also in terms of nested intervals doing shadowing, but now the, the nested intervals, instead of being textual, are temporal. So uh, it begins with uh, a, a function call creating a stack frame that contains a definition of a given variable. It ends when that function call returns. And while that function call is on the stack, it is shadowed by another nested function call that defines a binding for the same variable name. So it's it's um, so the, the nested intervals are associated with name um, uh, over a given uh, temporal interval, whereas in lexical scoping is associated with the name over a given textual interval. Um, uh, and common Lisp, by the way, uh, uh, is mostly lexically scoped, but preserves dynamic scoping in the original Lisp sense, which is associated. With the, with the variable name, where there's no special privilege in being able to mention the variable name. Um, fluid scoping was uh, an invention by scheme programmers to recover some of the power that they associated with dynamic scoping, but to do that within the rules of lexical scoping in a sequential imperative language. And scheme is, scheme unlike actors is a sequential imperative language. Um, and now, um, uh, and this, this slide over here explains how they did that. So now, um, uh, and this slide over here, by the way, this one does not break any OCAP rules. This is perfectly fine. Uh, hardened JavaScript code, it's perfectly fine. Hardened JavaScript code for 
um, uh, being a shim for a new primordial, which is therefore needs to be uh, immutable and powerless. Um, and the maker here is top level and hardened um, and therefore does not close over an immutable state. It makes instances, this return of hardened open curly of these two methods, and the instances are mutable. They close over this encapsulated state variable and they mutate it. Um, uh, and the way to think about what this is accomplishing is the instance is now a first class object from an OCAP perspective. You either have access to the object or you don't. And you only have access to an instance if you're granted it because the maker is, is global, is ambient. Anybody can make new instances. That's considered to be not something that's, that we intend to deny. We intend to enable anybody to make new instances, which is unthreatening because anybody could have written this code anyway. Um, but the instances are genuine capabilities that enable communication through this mutable state, which is not surprising because the, mutable, the instances themselves are mutable. Uh, the, we're going to, to say that the instance represents a fluid variable. So the, the difference between dynamic scoping and fluid scoping is the, an, anal the analogy to a dynamic variable is now a fluid variable where the fluid variable is no longer designated by a textual name. It's designated by a first class object or designated by the capability that, that, that designates this first class object. Um, and now this object has two methods. The, the particular API here is derived from, from the um, async context proposal, but it's, but it's understood as analogous to any fluid scoping system. The two methods are run, where you give a new binding for the fluid variable, where that new binding should be in temporal scope during the call to the callback. So CB is a callback, which is called over here. Uh, the arguments are just for convenience here to be spread out over there. Um, uh, uh, there's nothing fundamental about that. Um, uh, uh, but what's going on here is that the implementation is remembering the, the, the binding of this hidden state variable, the binding of it to some value before the callback happens, it's then uh, assigning the, this value to the state variable just during the call to the callback. And then when the callback finishes, it's restoring whatever the previous value of the state variable is. Uh, so, so the, uh, so this is just you sort of directly reflects our notion of the temporal nesting. Um, and the uh, and and the to read the current binding, to do the equivalent of reading of of the way a use value of a variable reads the current binding of the variable, there's the get method on the fluid, uh, the, the, the fluid um, variable instance object that simply reads the state. Now, when we talk about variables, we have in JavaScript, let variables and const variables, um, and uh, which are lexical concepts. Uh, uh, in both cases, the, the, um, uh, the association of a use occurrence to the binding occur to the to the defining occurrence is lexical, but let variables su support this additional concept of assignment. Uh, we sh I should make very clear here, uh, and that was also the case, by the way, with some of the scheme implementations of fluid scoping. I should make very clear here that over here we're doing the temporal analogy to const, not the temporal analogy to let. Um, it's only on spawning the nested temporal interval 
that we can associate a new value um, to the, uh, to the uh, first class object representing the fluid variable. And during that, we can only read the corresponding binding. There's, no, there's, there's nothing analogous to assignment during that interval. Um, uh, and so first of all, be, before I go, so I'm, I'm, I'm next going to explain about sh why this is, represents shallow binding rather than deep binding as an implementation technique. But before I do that, uh, how clear was what I said so far? Uh, and any questions or any corrections or any important additional explanation that I omitted? Yes, so uh, Mark, I'm still fussy about the difference between the one that you have in the screen and the one that you have before. Okay. Where the, the, the let was outside. Right. Out. Okay. So, um, so good. Uh, so this slide, uh, slide number one and slide number two, implement exactly the same semantics, but they implement the semantics in different ways. Uh, and in particular, as a proposed powerless primordial, uh, this implementation violates the rules for a primordial for an object capability language. The idea is that make sync context would be uh, pervasively shared among things that should not be able to talk to each other. Um, but even after hardening it, uh, the, the primordial object, the maker, has access to this mutable variable, which it in fact mutates. So to make very clear uh, um, in the, 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 the sense in which this violates the rules, um, I see, is Peter here today? Uh, nobody from Modable is here today, I can see. Um, so Peter was here last week. And I verified with him uh, that uh, what I expected, which is uh, this code make async context passes his purity checker. Uh, 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 make async context has no hidden mutability. Um, uh, so after hardening, there's no mutability left. It is, it is pure. The instances would fail the purity checker because they capture the state variable, but the state variable is only per instance. Uh, Modable purity checker applied to make async context over here on slide one fails the purity checker. Um, uh, and it fails the purity checker uh, because the, the, this function has captured this mutable state. Um, uh, and the mutable state is, it's a set, it's, it's, you know, we, uh, this code would not work if we change that let to a const. Um, uh, and furthermore, the value of that mutable state is itself something mutable, this map, where the map itself also has essential mutability that we'll be coming back to. So this actually fails the, the, the purity checker on two grounds. It fails because this is a let variable that's actually assigned to. But even if this were a const, the value of the variable is itself something that is essentially mutable. Um, uh, and therefore, sync context, because that mutable value is reachable from it, uh, uh, the, this maker object is also uh, not pure. Uh, and therefore, by that check, would normally be disallowed as a primordial. Um, and uh, in, Modable, in Modable's case, we can make this very, very concrete with regard to the issue of what can go into ROM. Over here, make, make async context can just go into ROM uh, in the modable implementation for embedded can just go into ROM with no extra book, bookkeeping to simulate, to emulate mutability. Um, whereas um, uh, this one would, uh, this 
implementation of make async context. On my slide one, uh, could not go into ROM without some magical yeah. extra bookkeeping. So that, that, that part, I, I get it. That part, I get it. My question is, what is the difference between the two of them in functionality? Because in functionality, there's zero difference. And that's, that's really the point that I'm making, is that the observable semantics is identical. And therefore, this slide is actually safe in terms of the semantics it presents. And because this one is safe, in fact, even this slide is safe, which is Justin's slide six. So Justin's slide six, uh, even though it's implemented in, uh, through techniques that break the OCAP rules, the semantics, the observable semantics that it proposes is safe. And therefore, if this was the extent of what Justin was proposing, there would be no OCAP safety problem in accepting it into JavaScript. So, so maybe the, the question is really for, for Justin on line 19. That's the, the one that confused me. Is you're creating okay. a new map and you're passing storage to it. Um, so the reason the code is written this way is because it will build into async context, which is the actual proposal. Um, I'm using sync context in order to build an understanding and then transforming that into async context that actually uh, has the behavior that's modeled. Uh, the code between sync context and async context is 100% the same, minus the class name binding, that it, the, the class name has changed. Um, so the map clone that happens on 19 and the set that happens on 20 is in this code because it has to happen in async context in order for async context to behave correctly. Um, but in sync context, the reason it isn't necessary is because it only ever accesses its own key on line 20 and on line 30. Mm -hmm. Although it has access to the full map, it only calls that map with this value, which is the async context, uh, sorry, the sync context instance. So you only access your own key in a map, regardless of what that current map value is. Okay, okay. Mark, do you have the same thing for async? Yes. Yeah. You'll build into it later in this. Yeah. yeah, so let me just go back to my readme so I can explain the entire expository sequence. Is, and, also, oh, oh. and also we're down to 15 minutes, which is okay. really actually 10. Okay. Um, so once again, it's it's more important to get this right than to get this fast. Um, uh, and so I'm going to um, uh, I'm going to I'm going to hurry through. I'm going to complete the current questions uh, and explain as much more as I can explain. But we're clearly going to need to continue this in later um, uh, later conversations. I think. We might be able to skip directly to four and then five and six and skip two and three here. Uh, I'll try that. Okay. Um, so the, the so the basic idea here is that uh, six is to five as four is to zero. So I start with sync context, which is a rule breaking implementation of something that's actually safe. I then derive from it four, which is still rule breaking, but is minimally rule breaking in a way that still enables um, the full proposal. And then using the rule breaking of number four, I then derive number six, which leverages the minimal rule breaking of four in order to give us the maximal ability to reason about what is potentially unsafe on the full proposal. Okay, so now I will jump forward to four. So four still has a mutable top level variable. Uh, which is actually mutated. So over here is an actual mutation of the mutable top level variable. But it only has um, one 
source of rule breaking mutability, which is the let here, the, the mutability, the assignability of the top level variable itself. It does not have the other distracting mutability that we saw on earlier slides, which is the values bound to this mutable variable, each of those values are themselves transitively immutable and harmless. So, uh, let, so let's take a look at what those, um, those values are. But to, to do that, we will first take a look at where the, um, so the value of, of Dunderbar get is a function from a map to a value. Um, so, um, uh, so where this is used is in the get method, which is an instance method of a, oh, this should have been, I'm sorry, this should have been make async context. No, 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 this is slide four. I'm sorry, this is correct. This is still make sync context, which is not, which is still implementing a non- is implementing a safe semantics by rule breaking means. Um, so, uh, so, the, so when we allocate an instance, we, we allocate this encapsulated weak map. Um, and then the get instance method uses whatever the current binding is of the global, of the encapsulated top level dunder get uh, variable. Uh, using the encapsulated um, uh, transposed map that's, that's specific to this fluid variable, specific to this instance of, um, of sync context. Um, and uh, so what we're doing here is uh, we're saving the previous so, so each bind, each value associated with Dunderbar get is a, it represents a different temporal interval. So we're, st we're stacking up the previous temporal interval into this prev variable. We then create a frozen Im uh, empty immutable object. Sorry, yeah, just a, a froze, frozen empty object, which therefore is powerless and immutable but has a unique unforgeable identity, which is key. And that corresponds because we're creating that, uh, that we're not creating that out here. So it doesn't represent, key does not represent the, this, the sync context instance. He represents the call to run. We're doing it per call to run. So, this, so the key is specific to a given fluid variable over a given temporal interval. In other words, key represents a particular binding of the fluid variable instance, but it does not contain the binding. It is an immutable powerless object whose identity represents the binding. Um, but then to actually get the bound value, the key is used to associate the bound value in the transposed map with the key. The transposed map is specific to the fluid variable, um, uh, the, you know, the fluid variable, which is the sync context instance. So the value is still specific to, is, is bound to this fluid variable as of this temporal interval. And then um, having created that binding, then we create this um, binding of the global get variable uh, that, um, that maps from any map to um, uh, a, uh, a deep bound lookup, which is a lookup that's going to walk back through a linked list of these get functions. So basically, um, you can see by inspection that the closure here, um, the closure here uh, is capturing P 
and capturing prep. That's the 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 very the the lexical variables captured by the closure. So to verify that the closure is pure, we verify that P is itself a pure object. He would pass uh, Modable's purity checker. Prev is the previous is the value of the previous binding of key, uh, and 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 therefore by induction it is pure, and therefore uh, uh, this closure has captured no mutability, and by hardening the closure, the new binding of get is pure. So there's so so that's pure, and then having done that binding to the global get, we now call back the, the, the call the callback. And the key thing about calling the callback in this context is that, uh, that, that projects this temporal interval across any other use of fluid scoping to further rebind the global get variable. Uh, and then when we exit the temporal interval, we restore the previous context. Um, so now uh, um, this code, uh, which is just in slide 11 and 13, the, this part over here of Justin's slide 11 is identical to Justin's slide six, except for the name change from sync context to async context. But then just in slide 13 adds this wrap function, um, which is makes use of the shared top level mutable variable storage. So, so, so turning that into the corresponding rule breaking um, that has minimal distracting mutability so that we can reason most narrowly about the danger. Um, this code up here, make async context, is equivalent to my slide four, except for the name change. But the, what the wrap function does is it, when wrap is called, um, during the call, it, captures the current uh, value of the shared mutable get variable. In other words, it captures the temporal context that is giving a binding to collectively all of the fluid variables that have ever been created using this maker. Um, and the maker is assumed to be pervasively available. So you can say that, th that this capture variable is capturing the all, collectively all of the, the fluid bindings associated with the current instance in time, the current temporal um, uh, context associated with now. And then when the, and, and then it's gonna return a hardened form of that closure uh, that closure, when called, will, will um, stack the uh, temporal uh, context, the, 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 the stack the collective binding of all of the fluid variables at the point where the closure is called. Uh, it will then it will then restore the uh, collective bindings associated with the moment when wrap was called, it will then call the, 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 the callback, call the function that's being wrapped with the restored captured scope. And then it will, and then when, when this function uh, completes, whether once again, whether it returns or, or throws, when it completes the previous binding um, uh, um, uh, before the wrapped function was called is restored so that nobody outside that call sees it. Um, and um, 
so, for, so first of all, before taking questions, let me verify with Justin that I gave an accurate explanation. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, and the so so the so the so the thing that's really intriguing about this from a safety perspective is that the uh, there are object capability languages which are not built on a sequential imperative base. Uh, there are the actor, the fine-grained actor languages, um, which have which which in which there's only asynchronous message passing, in which sync context was essentially impossible to write. Sync context became possible to write when. Uh, in specifically when um, OCAPS is combined with the temporal logic of sequential imperative programming. JavaScript, as well as hardened JavaScript, as well as hardened JavaScript with Endo, uh, is combines OCAPS with something more than just sequential imperative programming. It combines OCAPs. Uh, it also extends OCAPs over uh, asynchronous control flow uh, in JavaScript via then and in hardened JavaScript with endo via uh, eventual send, um, uh, which um, uh, and over eventual send to other VATs, uh, all of which are additional temporal extensions, which cannot be coded at the user level in the way they're available in hardened JavaScript. And, and uh, in particular, because then could not be coded starting just from a sequential imperative language, because then is primordial, but has access to the job queue, which is also top level mutable state. If we modeled the way in which then has access to the job queue, if we modeled that in JavaScript, we would find that then the then method is not pure by a purity checker. And the only th reason it's pure by the modelable purity checker is because it understands then as being a primitive part of JavaScript. Um, this is also changing, if this were accepted into an OCAP language and then in order to judge the result to be an OCAP language, we would have to judge the result to be an OCAP language under a different notion of what temporal context is, under sort of a different rearrangement of the association of time and binding. Um, did, all of that, did all of that make sense? Sara. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to get my head around it. Um, so I have two main areas that I, I need to explore. The first one is uh, why line number two is okay, um, assuming that obviously line 13 is doing some more advanced. Okay. Uh, this, is, this is more power there. And then the um, comparing this to the audio implementation, we was using some map or, or something that you were able to use. This is the storage one. So, uh, so and, uh, so sorry. Let, and then, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, so that's, that's one thing that I still don't fully understand. What's the difference between the two of them? I, I think I get it, but I, I have to dig in into why what is this um more difficult uh and the the second part is what you were mentioning like uh, okay so what exactly is different in terms of um ocap or labeling javascript as ocap uh if we accept this that part i, I didn't quite get um okay. yeah so the um so 
so the, the, let me answer the, the so it's 11 o'clock. I will try to squeeze in an answer to the first question. And the second question uh, truly is the, the, the big open-ended one that, that could very, that we should- Yeah, I, I, I'm not super questions. worried about the, the, the first one though. I'm more okay. worried about the so, second one. And okay. to be more specific, Mark, the, the I, I still don't get my head around the, the the problem with the scoping that you're talking about in terms of okay what is it that is changing at the language level that has this new thing that we can that we have a hard time reasoning about it because from code I, I haven't seen how that is even possible to get your hands on something that wasn't there before some something is changing and you just don't don't know who is changing it and i i don't feel that this is introducing that and it, it feels to me that that's where you're hesitant so, right so this this the weird coupling the weird communication between parties that would not be possible under normal ocaps in a sequential imperative ocap language that is possible in this extension is that, uh, let's say that Alice and Bob are both inside the same hardened JavaScript system. Um, and they're therefore sharing the same make async context primordial. Okay. Uh, and Bob makes a, um, a, a, a fluid variable, in, instantiates uh, make async context to create a new instance. Um, and then uh, Bob makes uh, two calls to Alice um, through a membrane, let's say, where the membrane is uh, going to prevent, is going to censor, is going to prevent anything mutable, any, any direct access to anything mutable from going through the membrane. So the membrane is, is imposed, let's say, by Carol, that's trying to really reason about limits on the communication between Alice and Bob. Al Carol's trying to make it very hard for Alice and Bob to communicate in ways that Carol cannot monitor. Um, so far, so good. So far, so good. OK. So now, um, uh, Alice, uh, during um, the call from Bob calls back into Bob. And Bob can tell that the time at which Alice called back into Bob is during Bob's call to Alice by virtue of the fact that, that, that Bob's own fluid variable, which he was not able to share with Alice, the async context instance could not be shared with Alice because of Carol's censoring membrane. But during the callback, Bob can tell that the fluid variable has the binding that Bob gave it because it was called back during the call to Alice. But so far, there's no problem because one expects in a sequential imperative language that Bob could tell that he's called back during the call to Alice anyway. Now, let's say that we're in Justin's full proposal. Now, Bob calls back to Alice once, binding the fluid variable to true. And then Bob calls to Alice again, binding the same fluid variable to false. And then uh, each time Alice has done wrap to capture one of those contexts. So the first time, uh, Alice calls the, the wrapped closure that um, uh, calls it A. And the second time, Alice calls the wrapped closure B. At some later time, when everything is returned, there's nothing on the stack anymore. Um, but uh, Alice spontaneously calls some object of Bob's, again, through the censoring membrane, calls some object of Bob's that Alice has access to, Alice has been given, you know, Carol has allowed Alice to have access to, 
um, but has censored all of the parameters. Um, you know, let's say it's, it's, it's can pass zero parameters. So Alice now calls some objects of Bob passing zero parameters, but depending on whether Alice calls it using her A wrapper closure or B wrapper closure, uh, she communicates either a true or false to Bob. She can communicate one bit of information to Bob, uh, which is which of Bob's calls to Alice did Alice temporarily capture and use for the callback? And Carol monitoring the censoring membrane, uh, it looks like such an additional bit of communication was not possible. I think that we have to call here. Oh, thanks again, Mark. We'll um, presumably continue next week. Okay, very good. And I will, um, because I went over um, in a less confusing manner what I went through last week in a self, in a, I think in an adequately self-contained way, I'm going to refer the Friam folk to this recording and not the previous recording. Sounds good. All right, thank you. <laughs>